three, test, 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 testing. Sound good out there. Well, good morning. Hope you and hope you enjoying this great day the Lord have made. I know it's cold outside, but it's warm inside. So we are thankful to God for all His blessing that He has showered upon us, and this is a great day, great lesson. And hopefully we will get something out of it. Just want to go back to the first lesson that we had this year. And we had three outlines, dead, alive, and saved. Now, what God wants to show us is really that we once were dead. And now through Christ, we're alive. And not only that we're alive, but we're saved through Christ. And then we go, then um, the second lesson, which we had, since God, since we know that we are his children, uh, a problem, solution, and relationship. Just because we're saved, that doesn't mean we're going to have a problem. And just because we have a problem, that don't mean there's not a, a solution for it. And just because we find a solution, we still have to remember that we're in a relationship, not only with God, but with each other. So now we go to the third lesson of this year, which was still coming from the book of Ephesians. And... Uh, this, this tells us about, begin to tell us about the gift that we've been blessed with. And this gift will cause us to, to unify and also recognize the gift and also benefit from the gift. So today we'll be looking at unity, gifts, and benefits. So now, hopefully, as Paul write to the Ephesian people, you know, he was uh, letting them know that, first of all, you got to, you're dead. And secondly, you're alive through Christ. And then you're saved. So now we come to the point where Paul is writing to the congregation, and this letter goes out not only to Ephesian people, but it goes out to other people that were <clears throat> that were reading the letter that Paul had sent. Now, what we have to realize is that Paul was still in jail. He was a prisoner. But he did not let that stop him from getting the word of God out. So whatever you're doing, whatever position you might be in, you know, God have given you something, and there's no reason you sit for us to sit back and say, well, I can't do this because of my situation. Because God have shown us that he is able to see us through the situation that we might find ourselves in. So now, we're going to look at these uh, unities, gifts, and benefits. Because they are very important to us as Christians. They are very important to us as God's children. They are very important to us as our relationship with one another. So let us look to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> our Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come together in your holy and almighty name. Thank you, Lord, for your son Jesus who died for our sin and provides salvation so rich and so free. Father God, thank you for letting us know that we didn't come this far by ourselves. Letting us know, Lord, that we were once dead. You made us alive, and you saved us. And now, Lord, we look at the unification that we are to have as your body, as your people, that we might grow, that we might develop, that we might find ourselves uh, prosper, 
not in the worldly thing, but in, in our spiritual relationship with you. So, Father God, we ask you to open our hearts, our minds, that we might grow in the way that you have put before us to grow, that we may honor you in all the things that you have given us to do. Lead, Lord, another blessing. We ask in your son Jesus' name, he'll say alone. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Now, I was subject to a high calling. And first of all, I think we have to realize the fact that our calling is not just an average calling. Uh, and he's going to show us some of the things. He's going to show us first the unification, how he unifies us, and then he's he going to show us the gift that he has given us. And there's a benefit from those gifts. We are special, and we um, glean, uh, I should say, we are blessed because of our benefits with God. Uh, so we are special. He gives us something that he don't give to the world, uh, even though we may not have all the things the world may have, but we have Christ, and that's the main issue. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to look at the first outline, unity, verses 1 through 6, and we'll... Can you hear me? Okay. So, uh, I won't repeat all I said. I thought you, you guys heard me. <clears throat> but anyway, let's look at our first outline. Uh, unity in Christ, verses 1 through 6. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, and with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. Our Lord, one faith, one baptism one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Okay, unity. This is important because a lot of times we look at people and we feel like if I could just do that, if I just had this, you know, uh, uh, knowledge of this wealth or this whatever, uh, this education, I would be okay. But keep in mind, God made each one of us, and he gifted each one of us to a certain thing. And don't, you know, that gift that he give us, it may be that somebody, someone else have it. Not, we may not be in it by ourselves, but keep in mind, this is a gift that God gave you. And nobody else can give it to you but him. Nobody can take it away from you, uh, and he will not take his gift away from you if he give it to you. You know, as the old people used to say, he's not an Indian giver. You know, Indians, they feel like, okay, if you do this, that's fine. If you don't do this, then, you know, I'm going to take it. But God not like that. He chose us, and he give us the gift that he won't have. So when he said, I therefore, the prison of the Lord. Don't look at, Paul saying, don't look at me as a prison in the Roman prison. I'm a prison of God. You know, and he don't, he don't even count those chains, those what regulation that follow by him being a prison. What he does, he look at it, then, you know, the only prison I'm in is the prison of God. And so he said, that, uh, I beseech you that you walk worthy, worthy of your vocation. Now, walk is a way of life. Walk is what you actually do 
of what we actually say or who we are. When it, you find that in the scripture, you talk about that you walking in the way of uh, what God has given you. That is the way of life. He made you that way. He provided you with that. So therefore, you know, your vocation is what God has given you. Now, <clears throat> let me just say this. There are people born with talent. They can, they can do certain things, uh, and they are gifted with certain things. But the gift that God talking about here is what he give us when he said, he beg you, I beseech you, I plead with you that you walk worth of your vocation. He said, God has given you something. He has given you something special, and your life is to um, replicate what God has given you. You know, you know, and maybe maybe these, these things that happen to you, uh, you talk to somebody, you, somebody you meet or whatever, and sometimes they might say, well, are you a Christian? And you might say, yeah, how do you know? I can just tell because there's something, there's a God in you that is made known to the way you act, the way you do, the way you think. So he said, walk worthy of your vocation. Wherewith ye are called. God have called you to certain things. Now Paul illustrated this by in, in Roman. 12, chapter 12, not Rome, I'm sorry, Ephi, uh, Galatians chapter 12, not, no, Corinthians chapter 12, we'll get it right, Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about the gift that God has, and actually what he does when he concluded chapter 12 of uh, 1 Corinthians, he said, you have all these things but I'll show you a better way. And what he does, he come in chapter 13 and talk about the love. A lot of people refer to the chapter 13 as the love chapter. You know, so whatever God give us to do, whatever he blessed us with, you know, that love has to be there. It can't be something, you know, that, you know, uh, that I want to do that I think I should do but what God give us to do. And we'll get into that more later. So our vocation is our walk in this life. Our action, the thing that we do, the thing we don't do, so forth, because we are in Christ. Now, he said that we're to walk worth of the vocation that we, you're called. Now, verse 2 said, with all lowliness and meekness. In other words, he's saying with your vocation that God gives you it to be in lowliness and gentleness and meekness. Not uh, that means you're humble. You know, uh, you know, not the attitude, well, let me tell you about me. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. This, you know, and that's okay. But what God gives you, what he has instructed you to do and me to do, he said do it with all loneliness, all gentleness, all meekness, all humbleness, and long-suffering. Don't think that you got to solve this problem now because God has given you this and these are the things that come with it. You know, your lowliness, your meekness, your long-suffering, all these things come with your vocation that God gives you. And he says, forbearing one another in love. Putting up. 
we're praying. You know, the person don't have to love you. But we are, we're commanded by God that we're to love them. You know. And sometimes, you know, people can be very uh, difficult to get along with. But that's, no, that's not what we call to do. You know, we're to love men away. So he said, this is what you do. This is what God has called you to do. And verse 3 said, endeavoring. You're determined to keep unity in the spirit. You're determined. Not that you, you know, not that you're saying, okay, uh, I know this way it should be done, this way I believe it should be done, this way I, uh, the scripture said be done, but look, I got to do something. I got to, I got to act in a different way so people can recognize me. Oh, no. Oh, no. He said, endeavoring, continue to keep the unity in the spirit and in the bond of peace. Now, you think that Paul, as he was in prison, he couldn't go as he desired to go, and sometimes he couldn't do what he desired to do. But one thing about it, he knew who had called him. He knew what his position was. And sometimes we we lost, we lose... Uh, that, that part of our calling. Because we see somebody doing something, oh, I can do that. I can do that. I'm going to show I can do that. No. If that's not your calling, don't worry about it. And don't try to do it. Because God has called each one of us to do a specific thing. And actually, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he tells us about each one of us has a place. And it's something that God gives us, not something that we have or we just decide we're going to do it. No. Now, we can be determined. We can say, yeah, I'm going to do this because so-and-so will do it. If he can do it, I can do it. If she can do it, I can do it, and so forth. But let me tell you, if that's not your vocation, if God didn't call you to do that, then don't try to do what God did not call you to do. Because it's important. Because he has set things in order. He has set the, We're all body. And one thing about it, the body, everybody can't be the eye. Everybody can't be the, the ear. Somebody got to be the feet. You know, so uh, he said, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit. You are determined to keep the unit of the spirit and bond of peace. So, not only that we are to deter, uh, determine to keep the unity of spirit, but we are bound to keep peace. So it's not that we say, okay, uh, I'm not, I, you know, I have to submit. No, we submit to God. We're not submitting to people. We just do what God asks us to do. And I know sometimes we, and um, hopefully none of us is like that, sometimes authority mess with our head because we have authority and we're going to do it the way we want to do it. That's not what God is telling us. He said, keep the peace, keep the unity. Because what happened? I want to show the world 
that this is the way that it should be done, this is the way that my people do. So we'll be different from the world. You know, the world can't look, you know, we, we don't look at the world and say, well, they can do it, I can do it. We look at what God said for us to do, and we do that based on his word. Because actually, what happened? He said, God give the gift. He the one give it. We don't have no gift to give nobody. Only God can do that. So, so, he said, in verse 4, he said, there is one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One body, one spirit, one hope as you are called. So what happened? Not only that we have this gift that God give us, and keep in mind now, keep in mind, what God gives you, nobody can take it away. They may can slow you down a little bit, but they can't take it away. Because that's the gift God gives you. And don't care how many changes or what come up uh, trying to be like the world, you still uh, have a gift from God. And he still will use you for his glory. So, we are determined to keep the unity. It's our aspiration, our desire to keep the unity. So we don't have to say, oh, well, you know, they ain't going to treat me like that. No. Keep the unity. So he said there's one body. And you remember what Jesus said when, when they talked about him. They said that he was casting out demons in the name of Bezebel. He said, how can you do that? He said, the devil began to cast others out. They gonna, that's going to be a divided house. And it's not going to be unity. And it's going to, you know, it's going to be destroyed. It's going to fall. So what God is doing to us, he is instructing us that unity is very important to our Christian growth. That's why he says one body, one spirit, as you are called, and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. That you are one. You are one. Not a whole lot of different one. Not, you know, if I can do it better than this person can do. No. Mm-mm. So he said, but unto it. Oh, I don't want to get go that. Okay. One God, one Father of all who is over all and through all and in you all. See, God the Father, he's in us. He is the one give out the gifts. He is the one determine what gift that we have. Not, it's not something we, we decide, we're going to we choose what do we want to do. I remember uh, we had a faithful, and some of y'all might remember her. We had a faithful member. And when you come in this church, she would tell you, you're not going to sit around. You want to do something. Yeah. And she would just roll off all the things that's happening. But you know, how determined she was. The people have to realize what God had given them to do. 
They can't, we can't just go and say, yeah, so-and-so told me to do this, so I, you know, no. Did God tell you? And you might say, well, how did I know what God tell us? He tell us in the New Testament. It's Paul writing. Paul writing uh, to different churches. And all those in his writing, he would tell the people what thus said the Lord. Not what Paul wanted, not what somebody else wanted, but what God say. And he would always say, the gift that God give us is from God. Not, we don't think of, you know, now we can be talented and do a lot of things. You know, be, we can be eventual, invent stuff because of our talent. But this is something special, God. This is something that only God gives, a gift. And this gift for a purpose, for the unifying of his body. That's where it falls. And we've tried to make something else out of it. Whether it's me or who or anybody. We're trying to say to God, this is this what I this what we need to do. This is not what uh we this is not what we need to do, this is what I, I want to do. Because his greatness. Okay. So we see that. One God, one Father, and he is above all, and through all, and in all of us, he's in us. He's the one called the shots. Not we, but God himself. So, we'll stop. You may have some questions or some comments or something that uh, you want to ask. Uh, feel free to do so. If I don't have one answer, I'll get you one. Yes. All right. Brother Teacher. Yes, sir. When uh, it's beautiful to see that uh, the unity that comes from God and if we can adopt this in our lives, mm -hmm. it's easy to say it because this unity just don't, it's just in the church. It's everywhere you go. And if you can, I know it's hard, but you have to try your best to generate it. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times, even in relationships, this unity is very hard. Because uh, I have my way, she has her way. But, uh, I think it's very beautiful. We see the lesson that tells us, no, it's one way, and that's God's way. And uh, if we can adopt this, we'll see the beauty that it really exists in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, why is he passing the mic? Um, yeah, unity can be uh, development, can be growth can be togetherness in many things. But right now, we're looking at we as God peoples, the unity we're to have. Not to say, you know, uh, girl, you look good in that dress. Then as soon as she walk off, that, she, I don't know why she bought that dress. <laughs> you know. That's, see, that's, that's what God is teaching us, this kind of unity. You're not going to find this unit in the world. You know. And hopefully, as John said, you find in the relationship. But you're not going to find it in the world. You know, you look at the world now. We're in chaotic condition. You know. The people believe that a person that did all kind of wicked stuff to get would want and do things to people to try to make it, make them look bad and make him look good and all these kind of things. That's the way the world do. You know, it, it's the old people, you said dog eat dog. But God said, no, I don't want my, my people, I want this to be a special people.
people that people can look at regardless of where they're looking from, what country they're looking at, but they can look and see his people. And you know what? God did this with Abraham, and they didn't work out. They got to the point where they wanted to do like everybody else. And he had sent his son Jesus to die for the whole world and to teach us unity because God has a special, pe special people. And when he come back, he's not coming back to, to the world. He's not going to come back to the president or to senators and all these kind of people. He's coming back for his people. And the people that he has given direction to be unified. And those that decide that they want to do what God say do, and the way God say do it, then those are the people he's going to take with him. Because they were obedient children to him. Well, yeah, you, yeah, you're right. You need the world. If you're going to be successful in anything, you need unity. You're right. But this is a special unity that God that's calling us to be. That is not calling the world to be, but he's calling his church to be. Okay, Angela, I thank you. Yeah, I was just thinking about um, what you were saying and the fact that, <clears throat> you know, I grew up in this church and I'm almost 60. I can't believe I'm saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway... You know, I always felt this pressure. You know, I was thinking about what you were saying about, you know, the lady that was saying, you know, you need to do something. You got to do something, you mm -hmm. know. You know, it was always like, well, you you need to do something. You you need mm -hmm. to get in the choir. Mm -hmm. You need to come get in the choir, sing in the choir. It's like, I don't really want to sing in the choir, but mm -hmm. I feel like I need to do something. So let me get in the choir. And I did that for probably 20 something years. And I, don't even, I, I didn't even like doing it, but it was just the pressure to feel like I yeah. had to do something, mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, people will say, well, you know, I want you to do this. And I was like, nah, you know, I don't really, no, pray, I, I want you to pray about it. Well, I don't need to pray about it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> So I'm just I'm just saying all that to say that mm -hmm. you're right. You need to, you know, until I was able to ask God for myself, mm -hmm. what is it mm -hmm. that I'm supposed to do? I, maybe I'm not supposed to do anything, mm -hmm. but you lead me to what I'm supposed to do and what will be fulfilling and what will really be, you know, what what I am gifted to do. So mm -hmm. I think it's important to... Just make sure you know and don't feel the pressure of, well, you got to do something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's something wrong if you just sit here Sunday after Sunday mm -hmm. and don't do anything. You need to do something, mm -hmm. you know, or pray about it. Don't give me an answer now. Just pray about it. It's like, no, I don't need to pray about it. I already know, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just make sure that you, that you are hearing from God with whatever right. it is that you right should be doing and don't let anyone pressure you or, f or make you feel like, you know, just if you're just sitting and, and uh, hearing God and, you know, focusing on the word, that is something wrong with that, mm -hmm. you know. So I just wanted to share that. But I like what you said about, you know, make sure you know. Don't, yeah. don't get up there singing knowing that you can't sing, mm -hmm. you know, or don't get on the usher board knowing that you – are not kind to people. That right, you, you right. know, being mean to people. Mm -hmm. Be where you need to be. Mm -hmm. You know, where God will have you to be. That's it. That's it. Good, good. And that's the thing that a lot of us don't uh, don't realize because we don't want to uh, sister, brother, so and so and been they've been in church a long time. We, you know, and they're telling us that this is what we need to do it. And we don't want to be disobedient to them, so we want to kind of follow the instruction and so forth. But God's word, that's, that's the thing about these lessons. God's word teaches us that gift is given by God. And God give us, he knows 
what he has set aside for us to do. So, you know, uh, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of, a lot of us probably had the, the same thing or uh, went through the same thing that Angela went through, you know. Um, I really tried. I tried to get in the choir. I know I was, and I felt like I was a dedicated member. You know, I was so dedicated to, you know, to the men, uh, when the women day, they had a women saying, I just come on, I get up in the choir, look up there, nobody know me ends up there. I said, okay, I don't supposed to be here. <laughs> so, but anyway, we can, that, that pressure can come. And that pressure can make us think that we are supposed to do this, are supposed to do that. And it t- sometimes it takes a while for us to see what God would have for us to do. And once we see that, once it's been revealed to us what he wants to do, then we should go after it wholeheartedly. Not necessarily... Uh, because, see, you know, when, when you go back to Romans chapter 12 and you look at those gifts, he talks about the gifts that people don't think much of. You know, they just go out and don't pay no thing. But he says a lot of times that's the most important gift that he has for the unify that body. So don't worry about what people think or what people say. Is this what God would have me to do? And once you find out, once he gives you that answer, then you should be determined not to let anybody stop you. Because this is what God say. This is what he is doing. Okay. Anyone else right quickly before we move to our next outline? Okay. Let's read our next outline. Gifts uh, 7 through 10. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivities captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what it is but what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might feel all things. Okay. Okay. Now, he tells us about the gifts. The gift is what Christ did in our behalf for us. So, now, he says in verse 7, but unto every one of us is given grace. He said this is according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And you hear the phrase a lot that Christ died for us all. And what he's saying, this gift that God, that Christ died for us, was given to all. So now there's a gift for us in the death of Christ. So, what we need to understand is, is more than, you know, we, we just can't stop to, well, you know, he died for me and that's, that's it. Uh, he did more. He did more than just die. He died that what? We may have eternal life. He died that we may be, that he may gift us with things. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
he may he died that he may gift us with things that he has already provided. Because the scripture tells us that he was slain from the foundation of the world. So Christ knew that he had to come and die for men, for mankind. When I say men, I mean men and women. You know, he he died for all humanity. Okay, so uh, he did this what according he gave grace according to the measures of the gift of Christ. Now. Nobody gift gonna be greater than Christ. You know, because Christ died for us. Christ died while we were yet sinners. The scripture tells us. A lot of time a lot of us weren't thinking about God. But he died for us anyway. A lot of us were not thinking about, you know, the gift that God had for us. But he died for us anyway. So he said, this gift was from God, from his son Jesus. Now he said in verse 8, wherefore, he said, for this reason, he said, when he ascended up, up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gift to men. Now, when he died, everything broke free. Because he had sacrificed his body for the sins of the world. Now, he gave gifts unto men, your humanity. He gave us gifts. And if you don't think anything else, you can think the gift that God gave us was eternal life. Because this is the reason he died. And don't ever think that because you're a nice person and, you know, you can, you can get some accolades from a lot of people, you may get the accolades from the whole church. But what happened? God gave the gift. And so when he ascended on high, say he led captivity captive, he took the sin of the world and he died. And it was, you know, I was this. It's, you know, what Paul said, old death was that thing. He broke the chain of death. Now, you might say, well, people still die. Yes. But the Bible said we that uh, children of God, we sleep. We don't die. I know people say, well, you know, but you'll sleep. And this is a different sleep because, you know, just regular physical sleep, you can, somebody can shake you and you wake up. But when you did in Christ, you know, when he died for us, I should say, then it's a new death. Because we're asleep and nobody can wake us but God himself. And when he had set time that he would come and he would wake us up. Nobody can do this. You know, you can go, so you can go all over. You can get doctors and they can try to uh, revise you or whatever they want to do. They can't do it. But only Christ can do this because this is the gift that he gave us. And verse 9 says, now that he has ascended, what is it but that he also descended? He ascended? He said, 
he also descended. He descended first. He went to the grave. <coughs> Excuse me. He went to the grave. And said the lower part of the earth. They buried him. But what happened? See, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heaven. Do you remember when in the book of Acts, when Jesus got ready to go back to his, his father? And the angels in heaven said to the men that were watching, so why gave you at this? It's the same Lord that you see going up will then likewise come again. He going to come back. He ascended above all the stars. You know, the great thing about us as God people, you know, we have a God. And, you know, don't limit him to the solar system that we see or that we read about. But we have a God that created all that, and he can go further, way above all that that we see and that we read about. So, he ascended uh, above all heaven. What? That he might fill all things. This was done, what? That Jesus Christ may fill all things. So, don't let anybody tell you that you got it. You can do whatever you want to do. Now, I know when you read uh, uh, Philippians, yeah, you can read about, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. But you need to read the context. You need to read what happened, what Paul was saying, what happened to him prior to that. And he was saying, he didn't say I, I learned to overcome it. He said I learned to uh, be content. I'm satisfied. You know. And then he said, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm strength. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. I can be able to be hungry and all full all the same time. I can be able to suffer for want, and I still have plenty. He said, I can do these things. I can do them through Christ who strengthened me. You know, he, he didn't say, he didn't mean that he could just do whatever he wanted to do, you know. Because he talked about the things that he was lacking, the things that he needed help with. But he said, I can do them through Christ who strengthened me. So don't take, you know, we, what we do, we take, sometimes we take uh, a few verses out of the Bible and take it out of context. And we, we try to, you know, and it sounds good, you know. It sounds good to people. But it really is reality in a Christian life. If we want to do uh, what uh, Paul had did to consider, uh, continue, I should say, to worship and praise God for who he is. <clears throat> so, uh, with that in mind, let's look at our final outline and let someone have some questions or comments that they want to make. Uh, if not, let's look at our final outline. Benefits, verse 11 through 16. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, 
unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of man and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted, compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make it increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Okay. Now, the benefits. There are some benefits that we uh, receive because of what Christ did for us. And also those benefits is, 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 is also based on how we conduct ourselves as God's children, you know. So, now, he said, he gave some Christ, God. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now, when you look at the word apostles, that means that these people uh, walked and talked with Jesus. And I know you say, well, you look at Acts chapter one, Matthias, he was the one that was selected after Judas was, was killed himself. So he, you know, we don't consider him as apostle. But keep in mind, Paul, uh, apostles of Jesus Christ, and Paul said that he was a pastor out of due time. That means he did not walk with Jesus. He did not talk and eat with Jesus as the eleven did. But God chose him as a pastor. Now, apostles don't exist today. Now I know some of you might say, well, I know some apostles, and they, you know, but they doesn't exist today as they did in Jesus' days. So you can go back and reread it, do the examination, and if you find some apostles that exist in the same manner that these people did, then you let let me know. But they do not exist in the way that they did in Jesus' days. Based on scripture. The prophets, now I know the scripture talks about prophet in the New Testament, but all the prophets do is retell what's already been told. Those are prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so forth. God would come presently and speak to them and tell them what's going to take place. And it did take place. Now, I don't care what people call themselves today, but there's no prophet today as it was back in those days. There's nobody. See, in first. In the uh, first chapter of Hebrew, it said, you know, in, t in time past, God spoke to us in sundry time, dive of mountain, and so forth. But he said in the last days, he spoke to us through his son, Jesus Christ. So now Jesus Christ is the, you know, is the one that we hear and the one that we, he told about the thing that would come to pass. Even in the book of Revelation, he covered what would take place. 
So there's no prophet today as it was in the Old Testament time. Jesus Christ was the last. Now, he said some evangelism. Now, evangelism is people that go out and witness for Christ. So we still have evangelism. People can go out. I know they're far and few in between. You don't see them. You probably don't hear about them unless you do. Uh, we support uh, evangelism. We, uh, this Mount Calvary Church does. But actually, that can be anybody that will go out and tell people about Christ. They witness about Christ. They witness about the scriptures that they read about and what God have did in their life, so forth. So evangelism, still okay. Now, he, when he closed this, this verse, some pastors and some teachers. Now, you know, he put those together because pastors... Is the leader of the people, and he also are teachers to the people of God. Now, there's pastors and there's teachers. There's pastors that is, is, is lead a congregation of people, and there's teachers that teach what thus said the Lord. So these two he put together pastors and teachers. They are both um, pregnant to the word of God. They are both important to the word of God. Now, he said, this was done for the perfection of the saints to unify, to make it perfect, because this group that he had put together, Paul saying, this group was completely different from any other group. So, you know, so when we say that we're God's children, we're his saints, you know, then, you know, we're saying that we are part of this, this uh, profession. Now, you know, that... <laughs> There's people quickly say, well, I'm not, I'm not perfect, nobody perfect. Well, that's not the question. It doesn't even come in, in it doesn't even come in play here. You know, you don't have to tell people you're not perfect. We all know that. Anybody want, want somebody to think they're perfect, then they, they go in the wrong direction. What it was, what he was saying, this was for the full development of the saints. We are, we are being developed. We're being complete. You know, so therefore we are getting, we are on our way to perfection because we are being developed into what God would have us to be. So he said this for the perfection of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. All this that we see in verse 11, you know, still God have not left the church without some leadership. He have not left the church without unity, you know. Then he said in verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. We need to know who Jesus is. We need to know that he is the Son of God. We need to know that he came to this world to provide eternal salvation for his people. And this, you know, when we start, when Paul started off in the book of Ephesians, he started off letting them know, letting us know that we was dead. And then he talked about we alive. And then he talked about we'll save.
the, so those are steps that God take us through because we thought, in, in a lot of instances, we thought, oh, I'm all right. I'm not like that person over there. You know, I'm better than they. No, you're not. You know better. You might think you're better, but you're not. So what are you doing? He is perfecting us. And as we learn to do this, we become edified. We become, we, we are unity. We're unified of the body of Christ. You know, we may not, uh, and I know this is uh, taboo for people, but you may not like somebody, but you can love them, you know. You may not even say, uh, hey, I want you to come to dinner with me. That may be people you would not invite to dinner, but you can love them. There may be people that, you know, you don't want to go anywhere with them, but you can love them because God says so, you know. So he did this for the edifying of the body of Christ. And he said, till we all come in the unit, the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God. This you know, this will work continually. God is doing. He's doing to unify our faith, to have, for us to have knowledge of the Son of God, and to a perfection man. We are matured man and women in Christ. So, so he said, this made me of stature and of fullness of Christ. He said, for we henceforth, we no more, be children of children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. He said, he said this reason that the unity of, of God's people put together. Because there would be people coming saying, hey, you know what? Uh, this is what y'all do. Come on over here and we'll show you. No. Because a lot of times they're being trickery. They'll make you think that, you know, you better off over there with them. But you know what? I don't know about you, but I often thought, you, know, you don't hear it much now, but I often thought, and you may too, I don't know, what's going to make me any better if I go to that church or that group of people than I am here? What's going to make me more acceptable to God because I go and join another church, I go and, and you know, and shout hallelujah. I'm not, not, nothing wrong with shouting hallelujah. Nothing wrong with shouting at all. But I couldn't do it in my own church. But I can go there and do it and be accepted where I'm not accepted in my own church. Now see, when we get to that point, what is happening? We're taking man word over God's word. See, because what happened, we, God say, you know, this is what I need you to do. This is what I want you to do. This is what I call you to do. And you say, no, no, God, I, I need to get over there so I can be among other people that are doing this. What, what happened? God may want you to be that person to unify that church, to unify that group of people, rather than running to somebody that, uh, you know, being, being accepted uh, for what they are 
and what they are doing. So keep in mind that God has already chosen me and you to be vessels for him. Not for a certain congregation, but for him. So, he said, henceforth, from now on, you won't be children tossed to and fro, caring about with every wind of doctrine, but, I'm sorry, by the slated of men and corning and craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive you. See, the devil, is a, he's a great gambler. And he's saying, and it's just shows through Scripture, he's saying that, you know what? He said it to God. He told God, if you, you know, you, you're protecting Job. If you, if you take all this stuff away from him, he going to curse you. But Job didn't. So what happened? God, I'm sorry, Satan is a great gambler. He gambled that you may follow or you may listen to what he's saying. He don't know. But all he can do is try and put it before your face and make you think, oh, yeah, this is it. So he said, this, this reason that God has put us together so that we won't be talked about with every wind of doctrine, every time somebody come by, yeah, that's it, that's it. You know, why can't we do that? No, do what God tell you to do. I need to do what God tell me to do. And then things will fall in place. So he said in verse 15, but speak the truth in love, may grow into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. He said, speak the truth. You don't have to lie about it. You don't have to make excuses. Just speak the truth. And then 16 said, for from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compassed He comforts us by that which every joint supplies. And he said, this according to the effectual work in the measurement of every part make increase, make its increase to the body unto the edifying of itself in love. To the body, to the edifying, to the edifying of self. That is, this body become a complete unity of itself in love. Because what God, Jesus Christ, have put it together and have given us the gift that he wants us to have in order to make it work. See, we don't come with our own gifts. We don't come with our own sin. We don't come with our own way of doing things. We come through the grace of God, through his teaching, his direction. That's how we come. Okay? And we'll stop here. If you have any comments, any questions uh, concerning our, the benefits, feel free to do so. If not, we'll close, we'll close in prayer, and then we'll ask uh, our superintendent to come. Our Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to just to see what you have, what you have done and what you are doing. Lord, that we might bring glory and honor to your holy name. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you for what you have done. And thank you, Lord, for continually providing for us that we may walk in the way
that you have commanded us to walk, that we can be a light through the dark world, Lord, that you be glorified and your body be edified. Thank you for the time. Thank you for the privilege. Thank you for the benefit that you have given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Good morning, sisters and brothers. I'd like to greet you in the adorable spirit of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'd like to say to you all, it's good to see you all this morning. I know the weather's a little bit tardy out there, but our God heats us up. He keeps the blood warm in our bodies. And uh, I also like to uh, to the sick and shut in, to the bereavement families, those who might be struggling with something. From the Sunday school, we put you in our prayers and hope you for a speedy recovery, whatever it might be. Let us stand and be dismissed, please. Dear Father of Heaven, we come thanking you this morning that. You stood by our bedsides all night long, and then early this morning, Father, you touched us once again, gave us another brand new day to be with thee, to be with one another. So we ask, Father, that you will give us grace, the mercy, and the kindness that we need to share with one another, because this is a dark, hard world, and we need your guidance. Thank you for the Sunday school, the teachers, Lord, as they study, prepare, and deliver to your people. Bless the people, dear Father, they might grow in your word, because we need your word to be strong in us, because we never know when we might become separated. We need to have it in our hearts. So thank you for this day, as we will bless the message throughout this day. Lead us in your path of righteousness, and fill us, Father, with your Holy Spirit. For thy servant's prayer, pray to our Son, Jesus' name, forever. Amen. Thank God. You dismissed. Amen.